some people, um, they may ask for it. I have not gotten any requests, um, but especially if it feels especially like nurturing and relaxing to them, or they really just want to get that lotion on their belly because you can have like dry cracking skin. Um, those would be okay, but it would just be a light effleurage. You're not going to do any pressure at all. All right. Um, and then to talk about the essential oils um, that are contraindicated, always make sure if you want to do any sort of aromatherapy or use essential oils um, or have uh, products with scent, um, essential oil scents in them, um, just be extra cautious. Definitely look them up beforehand because it's very, some of the essential oils are really, really common that are contraindicated for pregnancy. Um, you know, things like wintergreen. Wintergreen is a wonderful invigorating scent, but it's contraindicated. So the, the list is, of course, um, much more extensive, but some examples of really common essential oils that are contraindicated are angelica, basil, chamomile, clary sage, fennel, jasmine, juniper, peppermint, and wintergreen. In one of the videos in the module, the, I don't remember if she was a doula or if she was the midwife, um, one of the women there, um, the pregnant woman was nauseous and she held kind of a peppermint uh, essential oil under her nose to help with the nausea. Is that like she really shouldn't have done that or like it's kind of, if you do it super carefully okay? If just... you have been trained, if you have like continuing the education in something like aromatherapy that is focused on contraindications that way or you are a midwife, um, I would say that that's probably okay, but just um, for our own liability purposes, I wouldn't do it. Um, if the mom brings her own like little thing of peppermint um, that she uses and finds effective, she can use it, that's okay, but you're not going to administer it. I have a question. Yes? Um, could you explain what is it in essential oil that makes them harmful? Um, well, as you probably saw from some of the reading, um, sometimes it's that it's a synthetic mm. oil that can be harmful. Um, some oils are only harmful when ingested or applied to the skin. So like the scent itself um, isn't a problem, but the actual, um, you know, like the natural chemicals in the oil um, can be harmful. Uh, it really depends on the oil. Um, you know, things like wormwood oil, wormwood is a poison, mm -hmm. and it can be used therapeutically um, for, you know, things like headaches and pain relief, but you're not going to, um, you know, use any wormwood with a pregnant client because you wouldn't apply poison to, uh, to a client. Um, so it's... It's something to do a little bit of extra research into um, to find out for sure, you know, like what applications um, are safe or unsafe. Um, because maybe in some cases, you know, peppermint is okay to smell but not ingest. It just it just really depends. And I'm not an expert on essential oils. And don't trust somebody who's just doing like the multi-level marketing essential oil. Um, selling because they are not an expert necessarily and, and um, cannot give health advice. So you want to make sure that you're getting your information about essential oils from a reputable source and not just your Aunt Kathy who um, has been trying to sell everybody all of the essential oils in the universe. I'm going to now do some multi-level marketing. I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, I, one way to explain it is that, you know, you see something like peppermint, and it sounds very harmless, right? It's tea, it's natural. Um, but the essential oils, you take, like, a huge amount of the plant and distill it down to, like, this much plant would be the little vial of essential oil. And so it's all the 
active chemical compounds that are the medicinal part of the plant. But it's much, much, much more intense than, say, some peppermint tea. And a lot of our medicines came originally from plants, or we learned about that chemical compound from the plant. And the essential oil is the most pure distillation of those compounds. I don't know if like that's overdosing helpful. overdosing yourself on peppermint? What's that? Is it like overdosing yourself on peppermint? Well, like you could, right? I mean, I've, I've, t I've had too much of essential oils before, even when I wasn't pregnant. Like I spilled uh, lavender one time. And now it's like I, I got too much of it, and now I, I can't really do it anymore. Okay. Yeah, but we're just more careful when clients are pregnant, right? Like some of these things, if you have an advanced uh, study, some of these things might be okay, but it's not something you dabble in, like Elizabeth was saying. There are, there are folks, there are certain essential oil, co uh, essential oil companies that are sort of famous for people just trying to sell their, their deal, and, and you just want to make sure that it's super clear what medicine they're taking. Like a naturopathic doctor, midwife, helping you with the medicine instead of somebody trying to make some money off of essential oils. Or read a book, like, hey, this might be nice. Um, it's, a, it's a little too strong to play around with. Yeah, super concentrated and can also have interactions with prescription medication. So that's another thing to keep in mind. Um, all right, let me just look at my notes real quick and make sure that I haven't missed anything. Um, so before we get into the intake stuff, um, let's talk about some massage specific um, things. So I personally prefer 90 minutes for pregnancy massages just because um, you have plenty of time, um, you know, sideline massage, um, your flow is a little bit different than it is under usual circumstances. It can take people longer to get on and off the table and you just want to do, you know, really thorough work. So 90 minutes is a great amount of time to get plenty of work done and also have some leeway so that you don't have to, you know, rush somebody off the table. Um, it is more likely that somebody may have to pee midway through a massage if it's a 90 minute massage. Um, it, doing treatment massage, myself, those are um, usually 60 minute massages. Um, but 90 minutes is a, a really um, roomy amount of time um, to be able to focus on your client and not, you know, feel pressured to get them turned over super fast and you can um, really take your time. Um, in some circumstances, I've had it happen once or twice where um, a pregnant client has brought in their birth partner or support person to learn a couple massage moves, either for at home or during labor. So like maybe, you know, a few like foot massage moves, maybe some hand massage, maybe a little bit of like shoulder work or around the hip. Um, most of the time it's just for, you know, a special treat at home or um, during labor, in which case foot massage and hand massage is really um, quite handy to do. But I've had a couple times where, you know, during one or two massages, they'll bring a partner in just to pick up some, some tips. So don't be surprised if that happens every, you know, once in a blue moon. Um, so the equipment for pregnancy massage. So we talked about sideline massage. We talked about semi-reclined massage. Usually in early pregnancy, um, in the first trimester, a lot of women will be totally fine being prone. Um, I leave that up to their comfort. As soon as they hit second trimester, no more prone for sure. 
Um, and most of the time, it'll become uncomfortable a few weeks before that. Um, but up until that point, if they're comfortable laying prone, um, I will let them go ahead and do what's most comfortable. I may not keep them in that position for a super long time. I may cap it at 10 to 15 minutes um, just because of that, that um, you know, pressure on the uterus. But especially in very early pregnancy, it's usually totally fine. Some women in their like second pregnancy will be uncomfortable right away. Like sometimes that's their first sign that they're pregnant is that they suddenly can't like sleep on their stomach anymore because it's just too uncomfortable. So let your client take the lead on that. Um, but I definitely, if, if you feel uncomfortable about that at all, you can just switch to side laying and that's perfectly fine. Can I add something on that? Yeah. Um, you might just think about the, uh, the pregnant uh, belly or tummy, but it's also very common for the breasts to get large and tender Thank even you. early on. Mm -hmm. So that can be part of the face down issue as well. And we do have body support cushion systems in there that aren't good just for pregnant women. They can be used for large breasted women or women with larger tummies or uh, at any time really they can be something helpful. I'm not pushing the face down position in, in first uh, uh, trimester. Um, I'm just bringing up the, the fact that it, it isn't just going to be their, their stomach that's bothering them. Yeah. Side lying and semi recline is, is always safe. So, um, so semi reclines, you're going to need um, usually a foam wedge um, with a cover on it so that it can be easily cleaned. Um, is the most helpful, and then with a sheet over that so that it's not, you know, super cold. Um, the pregnancy bolster systems um, are usually like a series of um, of cushions that like Velcro together, and that can be adjusted for your client's proportions. Mm -hmm. But it usually has a couple like divots for your breasts and a little divot for your belly. Um, sometimes there's like a divot for, you know, placing your arms. I'm not the biggest fan of the bolstering systems just because um, I feel like it puts pressure on your ligaments. Um, but it is a better alternative than the pregnancy massage tables that just have a big hole cut out in the middle. Um, that can be comfortable at first, but you're putting a lot of pressure on their ligaments. Um, and you're just letting the belly hang. It's not like being in the pool where, you know, gravity isn't as much of an issue. Um, but I, I do not recommend pregnancy massage tables under any circumstances. And I agree with that. And most of the main schools of thought around pregnancy massage say to don't not to use those but we have to definitely bring them up because women will find out about them and get excited about them and love them the tables that have a hole in them um so uh, i would say uh, don't use them but they're out there yeah um and elizabeth was talking about the semi-reclined position with a foam wedge so I just wanted to, I'm not a good artist, but I wanted to draw sort of some scale about how big these wedges are. Much bigger than the bolsters we're used to. It's like a big giant triangle that all the way from their head to their sacrum. So that's how, that's how long they are. Um, and so there's places like uh, foam shops where you can literally have the size you want cut out. Um, or you get your own foam and do that as well if you want to get one that big. They're the best way to go for semi-reclined to have a nice, wide, tall uh, wedge for the person. Uh, it works better than setting up pillows and so forth, but if, if you don't have a, a wedge like that. We and used to have wedges like that in our lab, and I need to replace them because they were damaged, so we don't have them anymore. Um. Places like Massage Envy will often have a bolstering system available for, um, for whatever pregnant client they have, and they encourage its use. But I find the, the pillows are easier to, 
to wrangle, easier to make adjustments with, and much faster to um, clean and break the table down afterward um, because lots of times the bolstering systems involve a like special folding thing and a uh, uh, like a bag that they go in. That's too much trouble. I don't have time for that. So. Um, all right, so, so your job as a massage therapist is to determine any risk factors or contraindications that might pop up. You are going to be attuned for this. We are, um, I try to keep this as simple as possible so you know what the red flags look like. Um, because there's a lot that goes on during pregnancy and some things, this is one of the reasons why some massage therapists just avoid it completely, um, but there are some things that pop up in, in pregnancy massage that you just have to make a few adjustments for and there are some that end up being pretty major contraindications. Um, so when determining, I mean usually if a if a mother has a high-risk pregnancy, she will know that it's high-risk. Um, but just in case, you want to make sure that you know what you're looking for. So high-risk pregnancy means that there's risk to the mother or the fetus or both. So that is not something um, that we play around with and make exceptions for. Um, uh, you know, the potential for harm is much too great. Um, so some of your questions um, that you can ask during your intake, um, of course you're going to want to know their age, their due date, um, you can ask if they've had pre previous pregnancies or history of miscarriages, um, their general health, um, that's all, um, you know, pretty standard on your intakes. I also find it really helpful to just ask every week, unless I've been seeing them really consistently and I'm making a note of it, sometimes I will lose track of exactly what week they are or what trimester they're in. If I only see them a few times, I will just double check um, because they will definitely know. Um, so any can history? I, can I pause there, Elizabeth? Yeah. Um, and you know, while every pregnancy is unique, for sure, um, there are some tendencies about things that tend to happen in each trimester. Well, definitely developmentally, the same things are going on. But as far as women's uh, symptoms or side effects, and so one of my favorite tools for pregnancy massage is to own a week-by-week -week pregnancy book. Or I also included a chart in your... Um, module about that, but I, I really think it's a, a very good uh, book to have, something like that. Yeah, this chart is super helpful just to kind of break down the kind of things that, um, that moms might be dealing with during their pregnancy. Like in the beginning, you know, it's the kind of usual that you hear about the stereotypical stuff, the nausea, vomiting, tender breasts, fatigue, m moodiness. Um, bloating, that kind of thing. Um, but it's just good to kind of know what to expect because when you get later in the pregnancy, um, you know, with things like Braxton Hicks contractions, it's good for, you know, if you're not familiar with what that is, to have a little bit of knowledge so that, you know, you know that that's a normal part of the pregnancy that's not uh, a red flag. Uh, Braxton Hicks contractions are like practice contractions, and they can happen for months. Um, so if somebody who doesn't know anything about pregnancy and childbirth might be a little bit alarmed by somebody in, you know, month seven having Braxton Hicks contractions, but that's not a, you know, a red flag that you need to contraindicate a massage for. Uh, that's totally normal. And here's our little library of pregnancy books. Um, I will pass out a week-by-week week one that I like right now, and I'll just leave the others out that you can kind of see which ones interest you. My favorite 
is this one, Pregnancy, Childbirth, and the Newborn. It is very dense, but it covers absolutely everything you could possibly think of. And these are written by local rock stars. Yes. This is by um, Penny Simpkin. Um, I, when I was trained as a doula, um, I went to the Seattle Midwifery School. Uh, but the Seattle Midwifery School has now become part of Bastyr University, and it's now, now called the Penny Simpkin uh, Institute, I believe. Um, uh, she is a very well-known um, expert on pregnancy and childbirth. Um, How so, long does it take to become a doula? Um, it took, I think, two full weekends. Mm -hmm. um, like eight hour days, eight or nine hour days. The first weekend was a super in-depth like childbirthing class like any parents would attend. And then the second weekend was specifically um, interventions that doulas can do and other education that we need. Um, I highly recommend it if you have any inclination uh, to becoming a doula. It's very fulfilling. It's difficult to make a living at. Um, I usually do it as on a volunteer basis. I only do like one or two births a year. I attended one in October, I think. Um, yeah, I think it was the end of October. Um, but it's, it's a nice service to be able to provide, even if it's just to, you know, friends and family. All right, so let's get back to the, the intake. So the red flags that you're looking for are going to be history of, of, um, of miscarriage, any bleeding or cramping that somebody might have. Um, it's not unusual to have a little bit of spotting in the very beginning of pregnancy, but if they're farther along and it's more than spotting, um, that is that is alarming and they need to be seen right away. Um, any cramping could indicate that they have a miscarriage that's uh, starting. Um, any history of preterm labor, if if they have had you know their last baby at you know seven or eight months, that is most likely they're going to be in a high-risk category for their next pregnancy. Um, and maybe even on bed rest to try to keep that from happening again. Um, you're going to ask about um, gestational diabetes, um, hypertension, preeclampsia. Preeclampsia usually comes on later in the pregnancy. Um, uh, gestational diabetes, they will be tested. I can't remember what week they usually do the test. Do you remember, Jennifer? Um, but most people will mention it to you if they have um, gotten a diagnosis of gestational diabetes. Um, any other complications that they might be having, you're going to want to check in, um, you know, how far along they are, how they're feeling today, um, you know, if they're sleeping well, is anything new coming up this week, are you having any different, you know, pain or swelling or, you know, heartburn kind of things. Um, have you been placed on, on bed rest? Um, I haven't had any clients who have come in when they're supposed to be on bed rest, but I've heard stories about people coming in um, just for their massages. That's the only thing you're leaving a house for. No, you're not going to you're not going to do a massage if they're supposed to be on bed rest. Um, and then anything else that they might be concerned about. Um, you know, sometimes it might be something minor, like the swelling in their hands and arms is causing, like, carpal tunnel, or it could be, you know, some back pain or um, tingling and numbness down the legs uh, that might come up. And those are both things that, um, that you will be equipped to address. Let me check my notes real quick. Make sure I didn't miss anything.
So some of the high risk factors um, that, that will put a mom in, into the high risk category include things like advanced maternal age, so being over the age of like 35. Um, sometimes um, that will place somebody firmly in the high risk category and sometimes it doesn't, it just kind of depends. Um, and that's something that they would have to discuss with their you know, provider. Um, I've, I've seen it happen both ways. Um, any history of miscarriage, if you have a combination of, of like two or more of these, then you're firmly in the high risk category. So if you have advanced maternal age and a history of miscarriages, then that's gonna contraindicate massage. Uh, history of preterm labor or uh, delivery, gestational diabetes, preeclampsia, so that's high blood pressure with protein in the urine and swelling of the lower extremities. It's very dangerous um, and that is not something that that um, we are going to mess around with. Hypertension as well. Um, lots of women have uh, trouble with high blood pressure during their pregnancy because the, the fluid volume in your body increases by sometimes up to like 50% and that can raise your blood pressure. If somebody is having multiple fetuses, so twins, triplets, or more, um, that is a high risk pregnancy and they should not be receiving massage unless they have special clearance from their doctor. Um, any vaginal bleeding or like unusual discharge, um, anything that seems like an infection kind of deal or potential miscarriage. Um, if it's, you know, in the ninth month toward, um, you know, their due date and they're starting to, you know, they tell you about some unusual um, discharge that they may be having, um, some like mucusy discharge, that's totally normal. Um, and that means that labor is going to start very, very soon. Uh, sometimes that can, it can happen a, for a little while for several weeks. Um, and sometimes it's dramatic and happens in a matter of hours. Um, but that would not be, mucusy stuff at the end of pregnancy is not a contraindication, but other you know, discharge, if they reveal that to you, that might indicate an infection would be a contraindication. Um, if they have had um, uh, cramping, bleeding, persistent uterine contractions, um, and they're not at the point to be in labor, uh, that would be um, quite alarming and you would want to send them to the hospital. Uh, some chronic illnesses um, will put people into a higher risk category. More than five previous pregnancies or fetal abnormalities. Um, infections of the urogenital tract, so bladder infections, vaginal infections. Um, a decrease in fetal movement over the course of 24 hours. Um, uh, that is an emergency. Uh, severe edema or extremely poor circulation in the legs. Um, that would be a local con con contraindication. But if the swelling is severe, it may also indicate preeclampsia, which is not something we're going to mess with. Um, so that would be something that you would ask a few more questions about. Any unexplained pain, especially if it's in their uterus area is always, um, you know, something to um, to look into and get clearance for. I had a friend of mine who was getting like persistent, like mid back pain that nobody could figure out what was going on, and it turned out that she had a severe kidney infection, and her kidneys had been pushed so far up in her abdominal cavity that they didn't even really consider